A Musical Life with video game composer Jason Graves. Jason Graves is a BAFTA award-winning composer behind some of the most popular video games, such as the Dead Space series, the 2013 reboot of Tomb Raider, and more recently, Far Cry Primal, which was just published by Ubisoft earlier this year. Jason combines modern classical composition techniques with innovative sound designs to create scores that are incredibly visceral and immersive. This episode of A Musical Life is brought to you by A Musical Life Mastermind. A Musical Life Mastermind is a place where I help musicians discover ways to think outside the box and find new opportunities. Drawing upon my own experiences as a classical pianist, co-founding a tech company, teaching hundreds of online music students, and hosting a podcast with over 300,000 downloads so far. Every week, we have live mastermind sessions, group video chats where we feature case studies and share ideas to help each other find more students, get more gigs, and explore creative ways to grow a career. If you're looking for a better way to make a living as a musician, I'd like to invite you to join the community at A Musical Life Mastermind. To get started with a free ebook on the number one resource you need to grow your music, visit a musical life mastermind.com. Once again, that web address is a musical life mastermind.com. Welcome to a musical life. I'm Hugh Sung. Video games are a $101 billion industry worldwide. To put this into perspective, the video game industry, by some estimates, is twice as large as the movie industry. As games become more and more immersive with photorealistic graphics and compelling storylines, high production quality demands a great music score. This is where my guest, Jason Graves, comes in. A classically trained composer and world percussionist, Jason has written music for film, TV, and nearly 80 games and has won BAFTA awards and nominations for his work on the Dead Space and Tomb Raider games. For his work on Far Cry Primal, a game set in the Stone Age, Jason created an entirely organic score, blending sounds created from natural materials such as wood, bushes, bones, antlers, clay pots, as well as a ram's horn, wooden flutes, female vocals, and an instrument called an Aztec death whistle. (laughs) Let's start off by listening to one of Jason's tracks from the 2013 game reboot, Tomb Raider. Jason, thank you so much for being on the show. Hey, Hugh. Happy to be here. (laughs) Now, video game music has come a long way since those primitive 8-bit soundtracks for games like Nintendo Super Mario Brothers back in 1985. But for me, I actually remember being blown away at Michael Hunnick's soundtrack for Baldur's Gate back in 1998. Did you yeah. did, did you ever hear that one? Oh, of course. Yeah. I I 
I think I can remember the main theme that, that came to mind as soon as you said it. It was the first time that I heard a full symphonic game score. I'm not sure if they use an actual symphony orchestra, but it sounded really, really good. And I remember I was doing some research on you, and I think you mentioned in one of your interviews that you were first blown away by video game music when you heard Michael Giacano's score for the Medal of Honor series. I'm wondering if you could tell us where were you in your musical career or development when you heard that score? Well, I remember physically I was in my first house because <laughs> as soon as you even mention listening to Medal of Honor, um, I picture sitting in my den uh-huh. um, when a friend of mine who's now a professor teaching music down in Florida, basically we, we, we were friends in college. We were music composition uh, buddies in college, his name's Dave, and they came to visit. And one of the first things he said, he showed me a CD back when you used to have to burn your own CDs to sure. actually be able to share music. He's like, dude, you got to hear this. And he put in the Medal of Honor score. And I just saw it said Medal of Honor. I didn't know um, that it was a video game or or anything like that. And I was just I was just blown away. We we both love John Williams. Yeah. And, you know, it had that very Williams-esque sort of uh, vibe to it. And I think it was in maybe 2000 because I've been in games right around 16 years. And it was that was at the very beginning. And I thought, wow. So I actually, because that's the kind of music that I wanted to write. So, But I didn't really consider games. And I thought if I could do music like that, but for a video game, that would be a lot of fun. And mm. I've he, he recorded in Seattle um, with the Seattle Symphony, and I've been there three or four times since then. And it was every time I went back, it was always sort of a full circle moment for me. That is so cool. So that's really interesting. So you actually, th- your first exposure was not to the game per se, but actually to the music itself. So you had a Yeah, I, I never played approach. the game. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I hear a collective uh, lament from all the gamers listening to the- like a worldwide <laughs> groan. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Did you ever get a chance to meet Michael Giacano? No, Giacchino. no, I haven't. I haven't met him yet. Oh, wow. Well, anyway, so I, I want to move ahead to your career. This is really interesting. So you were actually out of school then. You were a professional composer at this time? Yeah, I'd been out of school for uh, for about four years. Okay, okay, interesting. And so did, the, did that recording, do you think that recording changed the course of your life? I, I think, you know, honestly, I think that it did because before that I was working, like I said, I'd been out of school for maybe four years and uh, a couple of, the, a little bit of that was spent in Los Angeles, but most of that was spent back here in North Carolina where I live. And I was doing a lot of corporate music, busy, but not necessarily writing lots of music. I kind of was maintaining a, an audio company. So I did lots of voiceover and I would use um, previous tracks that I had recorded. Like I had my own personal music library. Every now and then I get to write something custom and also record some local bands and the sort of thing that I never would have said. Uh, when I grow up, I want to, you know, record political voiceovers and um, and local (laughs) bands. But I learned so much doing all that stuff. And it's kind of like that was four years of preparation to sort of throw myself into the world of video games where I'm doing sound effects and voiceover stuff and recording all these crazy instruments. And that's what's great about audio. Anything you do infers everything else that you're going to do. So even though I'm not working in corporate video now, I'm still doing all those similar tasks and trades that I learned 
back before games. And yeah, I think that that soundtrack really turned my ear and made me think, I want to do something like that. That sounds that sounds really neat. Very similar to like E.T., which was the first thing that really spoke to me when I was a kid. Mm. I didn't think I want to write movie music, but I thought, wow, this this music's this movie's got some really amazing music in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really interesting that you make mention of your work in audio and if I may even phrase it this way, it sounds like, you know, rather thankless work. You just do it. It's a job, but it's not artistically fulfilling. And yet, by doing those things, those quote-unquote menial jobs really gave you the tools and the training you needed for greater success later on. If you hadn't done those things, would you have been as successful as you are now? It it definitely would have been, you know, more uphill than, than it was. I still feel like I'm fighting uphill in a good way, learning new things, trying different things. Um, it would It was inevitable. It would have, I would have been like that no matter what. It just... I was getting paid to do it. That's mm. what was great. Mm -hmm. I was getting paid to learn what a compressor does and how to record a voiceover. <laughs> and no, you don't put reverb on the voiceover. I didn't know. I had never recorded a voiceover in my life. I remember like yesterday thinking, do I put reverb on this? I think you're supposed to put reverb on everything. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to jump a little bit. I, I had We had gone over these questions, but now that I'm hearing you talk, I'm, I'm so curious. Hearing this recording, all the experience you had up to this point, what did you do to pursue beyond, oh, this sounds cool, to, hey, I want to make this work as a career? What did you actually do? How did you pursue that? You mean in games? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, um, it was a lot of networking. Back back then, you know, 16 years ago, GDC, <laughs> which is the Game Developers Conference, mm -hmm. uh, it, was, it wasn't even San Francisco back then. It was San Jose. GDC is not what it is now. Back then, you would have, you know, 20 or 25 people uh, in doing music showing up at GDC. So you got to know each other uh, pretty quickly. You'll have to excuse me. I've got one of my one of my many members of the flock of birds that I have. Oh, you were not kidding uh, when you said you had a lot of birds. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was just is, a figure of speech. She's an African <laughs> gray, and I, I forget. she gets. If I get excited, she gets excited. That's so if you hear uh, any clicks and whistles and things, that's just... That's just her adding personality to that's the That's awesome. Well, we welcome your bird to the show. <laughs> so interesting. So you were you you reached out to this game developers network or this conference and back then of course it's not as large, but did that did that networking help you get started? It did. And you know, it gave me a sense of camaraderie because I met a lot of, I mean, essentially my competition, but they also became my friends. I mean, these are guys like Chris Velasco and Richard Jakes, Enon Zor, Jesper Kidd. I mean, I've known these guys forever now. And, you know, we don't really compete anymore because there's just so many different games out there. But back then, we would all literally sometimes be going for the same job. Mm -hmm. And different guys would get it every time. But it was a... Uh, it was there was a camaraderie, you know, sort of a band of brothers kind of feel, especially when we would get together every year. And beyond that, it was just you know going to E three, going to any conferences, doing lots of networking. My first job actually came around because I was networking with a flyer that you put in the mail because we didn't have email back then. And I was sending out maybe 150 every couple of months, and someone who was reading my flyer talking about whatever I was doing then had a brother that lived in Australia who was best friends with a guy that worked at a game company <laughs> and they needed music and they called me. There you go. There you go. The power of good old fashioned networking. That's amazing. It really was, <laughs> especially Australia. You couldn't get any further away. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time to divulge a little bit about how you broke into the industry back then. And now I'd like to jump ahead 2009, you won a BAFTA award for your scoring of Dead Space, one of the scariest games ever made. I never played it, but I saw some of the footage and, ooh, it's really freaky. Now, the, the BAFTA awards stand for the British Academy of Film and Television Arts. They're the UK equivalent for the Academy Awards here in the United States. So first, I'm really delighted to hear that they actually give prominent awards for game music. Now, why don't we have awards of that level of prestige here in the U.S.? <laughs> That's an excellent question. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what's neat about the BAFTAs? They have a film and television like week of awards. 
And then they have a completely different event just for the games. Oh, really? So every aspect of creating games is recognized and honored. And of course, there's you know, a lot of British folks there, but there's other folks from all over the world that fly out. And they, they do worldwide awards, just like uh, the Academy does here for film mm -hmm. uh, in the States. Mm -hmm. It's It just really speaks to the forward thinking over there in the UK with regard to giving video games and i you know i guess the word game maybe throws off some people but i don't think people appreciate what a deep art form it has become particularly in recent years it's a bit of a double edged sword because in my opinion if you if you make a game properly especially these days it's a seamless experience the the music works really well with the action which works really well with the player's choices and interpolating the story the right way and it's not you know, the, the the kind of clunky stop and read the choose your own adventure text now. <laughs> um, it's one of those things that if the game's done, if the game's put together properly, you actually don't notice a lot of the really hard stuff that was spent behind the scenes to mm. you know, make a smooth experience. Right. Well, let's t kind of hone in a little bit about the artistic influence within video games. Now, here's here's something I find really ironic. You know, many audiences and even a lot of musicians that I know will shun contemporary classical concerts featuring, you know, experimental techniques, extended techniques. And but the interesting thing is that in video games, those techniques are not only enthusiastically embraced, they're an absolute necessity, a necessary creative tool for composers in that genre. I mean, who who would have known that video gamers would become the best audience for cutting-edge contemporary classical music. <laughs> that is an interesting way to think about it. There's, um, there's, something, there's something to be said for fans of any medium that have music as an accessory. And I don't mean that in a negative way, because I'm the one that's providing the musical accessory here. But you know, people aren't going to buy a video game because of the music. Mm. Out of most of the time, I would guess they don't know who composed the music, even if they love it when they're playing the game. They don't think, oh, I have to get, you know, fill in the blank, Enon's next game, um, which <laughs> happens to be Fallout 4. Okay, so that's a, a great example. Maybe you don't know who Enon is, mm. but you play Fallout and you become this huge fan of his music. And that, that sort of uh, accessorizing on the coattails of something that is popular opens it up for a much wider audience. The same thing can be said for film music. The same thing can be said for licensed music on popular shows. HBO loves to license lots of stuff and those particular songs will get a lot of extra attention. And it's a great way to educate the audience in general. And I love what a great way it is to get just classical music in general, whether it's 20th century or not, out to, to students, to kids, kids these days, but really out to kids these days, because it's all, it's not all just pre-done loops and auto-tune singing, you know, there's, <laughs> there's a lot of other stuff that you can expose yourself to, and I think a lot of players appreciate that when they hear it in the games mm, well, now we have to start telling all of our music students play more video games <laughs> <laughs> <That's> so <funny. clears throat> i understand that for dead space you researched 20th century composers to learn more about extended techniques and even custom built instruments i'm wondering if you could tell us which composers were the most helpful for you in your research and what techniques of theirs found their way into your scores well, in my head, I started with George Crumb, who's a, a very avant-garde, but uh, very fascinating composer. And his score is just, they look like pieces of art. Mm. They're very non-traditional. Instead of being written the way music normally is, like like pages on a book, you read from top to bottom, left to right. Sometimes his, his music will go in circles or in squares, all kinds of different notation. And really, it really is beautiful. And it sounds... Very contemporary, but he uses all kinds of interesting textures. That was he was one of my favorites in in school. the The one that really kind of rang the bell for me was uh, Christoph Penderecki. Oh, interesting. 
He's a Polish composer who pretty much single-handedly invented um, any scary orchestral music that you hear in cinema these days. I mean, he he literally came out of school and, of course, all the Penderecki fans will throttle me if I'm wrong, but I believe <laughs> I can't, there, was a, there was a certain piece... Was it Threnody to the Victims of Hiroshima? Mm. I think I think it it may have been, or it may have been one of the previous ones. He came out of school and entered the national Polish uh, music competition and won. He was the youngest by five or six years that had ever won that award. And I think it may have been Threnody, which is one of his most famous pieces. But he does a great job at illustrating uh, textures through all of his music. And he has a very, very abstract way of of notating it. You have to kind of memorize the legend and different symbols mean different sort of things. But that's what all the film guys in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s really drew upon. Anything scary, and I've got PDFs of these scores, so I can I can see if it's Close Encounters of the Third Kind or mm-hmm. Poltergeist or Alien. Um, you see the exact same instructions the exact same sort of techniques that that Penderecki literally made up and and invented. That's so cool. Wow. Let's go back to your application. I saw a fascinating interview where you demonstrated some really cool techniques for creating some of the most frightening sounds, including one where you put some chicken wire on top of a trash can and bowed across the wires. It it sounds goofy, but you listen to it and it's like, I could see that in some awesome horror sci-fi movie or something. It was the most fascinating sound. And in another example, you play mallets on the strings of a piano frame. Can you share with us what other unique techniques have you come up with on your own for your scores? Mm. Well, I think one important thing to note is the the bowing of the fence. That's that's something that I did as a percussionist. I'm a classically trained percussionist, so uh, I would bow cymbals or uh, bow vibes, basically anything metal. You take a cello bow, put some rosin on it, you can get some interesting sounds out of it. So it's a natural extension to try bowing some other interesting things. Same thing with the mallets. Uh, Being a percussionist, I basically went to school for four years to learn how to beat on things. (laughs) And I've got, I mean, 50 or 60 different pairs of brushes, mallets, sticks, different weights, different textures and it's just amazing how even if i just took you know this glass right here that has got a little bit of water in it i could get a bunch of different sounds out of it just depending on what brush or mallet i use so Mm. that was where i was coming from with a lot of this stuff and it started really with tomb raider dead space was all orchestral and i didn't do anything i didn't record anything or play anything on there myself i wrote the music and conducted the musicians but they performed it was an orchestra just playing very abstract techniques and when i started tomb raider i wanted to do something more internal i i wanted to try to do some different techniques or play different kinds of things so that's where the the chicken wire that literally it's just It's convenience. We had a little bit of leftover chicken wire next to the coop. And I picked it up and was like, wow. And I looked and there was the garbage can lid. And I took the lid and took it inside. And there you go. It's just, uh, you know, walking around and looking to see what it is that I could possibly use for something.
I remember seeing some old old footage of documentaries of the original Star Wars. And I can't remember the name that the sound designer. I think his name is Ben. Oh, what is his name? Anyway. The ben s- Burt. Thank you. Ben Burt. Right. The sound designer for Star Wars and how he was illustrating some of the most iconic sound effects. You know, back then they didn't have digital tools. I remember one scene where he's standing by some sort of a power trans, you know, transmission tower and he's got it like a wrench and he's hitting one of the wires that's dug into the ground. And it gives that really cool laser bolt sound. Yep. For, it was it was like that, that's the sound just from hitting a cable, metal cable. That was so neat. And I think the lightsaber sound came from an old projector, film projector, something the hum of the film projector. Yeah, and what I loved about the sabers were he recorded these sounds, like two or three different sounds, and had them all playing at the same time. And then he took a microphone, basically put it on the end of a stick. And he would record the lightsabers, you know, swinging and clashing. It was literally like Foley. He would <laughs> he would move the microphone and it would sweep in front of the sound and you get this, woo, you know, this kind of pass by yeah. sound. And it just, that's how he got all that natural movement. He moved it. Oh, wow. Wow. Could you, could you share a few more of the techniques that you did? What Some other creative things that you did to come up with um, some unique sounds or textures? Well, really... I mean, I can look around in the room right now, and I've got actually that exact same garbage can lid. What, 2013, 14, 15, 16? Three years later is is hanging on a cymbal stand like it, was a, like it was a cymbal, but I was playing it with brushes, and it was just an interesting sort of metal sound. And then next to that is another, like, I guess a, a steel drum lid, like those big 50-gallon drums. So yeah. it's a really thick-sounding um, metal that I would just – bang on and uh, as current as we could get today i ordered about a hundred dollars worth of whisks <laughs> cooking whisks yeah cooking whisks different sizes and shapes just okay. to um now i do have some other whisks that i would i cut if you cut the top of them they kind of turn into these claws and you can bend them so that they're all angled the same direction it looks like a really creepy hand uh-huh. but then when you use them on cymbals or gongs and things you get this really sort of spooky sound but i just like the way whisks sound either just tapping them or or playing them on on different things so i'm just i'm constantly just trying new things and you wow. have one microphone, one mic preamp and, and you can play, I mean, anything you want for uh, Farlands, which came out uh, last month for Oculus. Mm-hmm. I had just mixing bowls. <laughs> I just ordered a, a couple of sets of $20 mixing bowls and they had these wonderful, amazing sounds. They didn't even tune them <laughs> and you can hear the mixing bowls and wine glasses, you know, throughout the entire score. That is so, so cool. Now, speaking of these really interesting, quote unquote, instruments or materials that you create sounds from, you use some really unique instrument combinations to depict the various tribes that the players encounter in Ubisoft Montreal's game Far Cry Primal, which was released in February 2016. First of all, I just described tribes. What are we what are we talking about? Can you describe the overall setting and story in Far Cry Primal? So, caveman times. <laughs> that's that's about as straightforward as it can get, which I okay. thought was really cool because yeah. all the other Far Cry stuff was modern. Um, you're caveman times and there are three tribes. You're one of the you're a member of sort of the middle tribe like the good guy tribe quote unquote and then there's two bad guy tribes that are uh you know trying to take over your land and kill you essentially Mm -hmm. um but they're very different from each other and they're uh, they're in different regions and they have different techniques and and everything else so that's that's sort of the setup for the game what's really interesting is that and i was really impressed that you came up with the creative choice to purposely remove modern concepts of melody and harmony. And you basically reverted to primitive sounds and rhythms that people or tribes in the Stone Age might have actually heard themselves. Sound effects, animal sounds. Of course, you know, being a, a classically trained drummer and percussionist, I'm sure helped a lot in being able to create such evocative "Quote unquote music, you know, it's it's a musical texture, but only as a as a percussionist could really come up with. So, 
Anyway, so there are, I understand there are three tribes represented in this game. I, I think if I'm pronouncing this correctly, the Izilia, the mm-hmm. Wenja, and the Udam. Which are the which are the bad tribes? Izilia, Wenja, and Udam. The Azilia and the Udam. Okay, Udam are the bad ones. Okay, so anyway, let's start with the bad one because <laughs> the bad one has probably the scariest sound. So I understand that the Azilia tribe, when you scored this, you used something called the Aztec Death Whistle. <laughs> it's I even love saying that name. Yeah. Fe- female vocals, vocals and ritualistic percussion. And when I saw that, I, I just did a double take and I started Googling it. I'd never heard of the Aztec Death Whistle. And when I Googled it and I saw this video of somebody demonstrating it, I have to say it's probably one of the most terrifying sounds I've ever heard from a musical instrument. It actually looks like a human skull. (laughs) And it's been described, the sound that it makes is described as the screams of a thousand corpses that apparently was used by the Aztecs in war and other pretty gruesome rituals. How in the world... Did you come across this instrument? Fortunately, I didn't. Ubisoft <laughs> already, they actually, Ubisoft already knew about it, not in researching for the music, but in researching tribes and tribal tribal warfare, uh, primitive living, all the crazy amount of research that they had done on linguistics and everything. The Aztec dust was just one of the things that had popped up. So when we were talking about musically breaking these tribes apart, which honestly, in the beginning, I was very daunted. Uh, It was a very daunting task simply because I had already really restricted myself. If we're taking any metal and plastic and you're not using synthesizers and you're not using, I mean, even drums that have metal on them and nothing with plastic. And that means a lot of other things. Wow. It's really like wood and skin and these very, very primitive sort of sounds. And I thought, if I'm already so restricted, I better make some really like even, even more rash decisions yeah. in terms of the sounds that I use for each of these tribes, because we wanted the music to give you insight into when you crossed into someone else's territory. There's no, you know, there's no boundary line that like entering Isla territory. <laughs> so we wanted you to know that everything is not okay and you need to watch out and, and have them be very accessible, instantly recognizable sounds that, Maybe you don't recognize them the first time, but when the Isla come up and t- attack you and you end up having to fight off for them, the next time you hear that sound, then you will recognize it for sure. <laughs> and that's hard because it's not like I can say, well, you know, let me use an interesting combination of orchestral instruments or yeah. let me find a neat textural sound in my synthesizer. <laughs> No, it's like, I mean, we're trying to like click bones together or rub some rocks together. And that's when Ubisoft said, hey, maybe you could do something like this for a vocalist Um, because I wanted to get vocals for all three tribes. Mm. And little did they know, I went ahead and had a couple of Aztec death whistles sent to me (laughs) as well as getting Maluka to sing. And that was what really sealed the deal for the Izulas were the... (sighs) The Death Whistles and Maluka's uh, very passionate performance. Now, for the Wenja tribe, this features the ram's horn 
and it actually starts with a solo flute. I'm wondering what made you decide on these particular instruments to describe this tribe. Maybe you can even also describe the flute, since you said you were not you were restricted not to use metal flutes. I understand, right? So, what were the characteristics that you were trying to convey with these instruments? And the Wenja tribe is your tribe, so oh, that's okay. the that's the safe tribe. That's the good <laughs> tribe, and it was the easiest thing to do, honestly, because it was kind of you know it's up the middle. It's fairly neutral and i i have seven or eight native american peruvian south american flutes and i thought it would be interesting to try something with some of them but maybe pitch them down a little bit they're all really high i mean like <laughs> like whistle highs just flutes, flutes like that just don't then they're all wood no keys or anything just literally you know, like a recorder in school, mm. but it's not plastic. You can't use recorders because that's <laughs> plastic. So these wooden flutes that are slightly out of tune and, and I could play them because they're dead easy to play. So that made sense. It was like, okay, well that's really easy and it sounds really earthy and natural and it's got all that breath and kind of, oh, you know, the, I can perform it and bend the notes a little bit. And the ram's horn was pretty much the same thing. I've had this ram's horn sitting around for 10 years or something. It looks cool, but I've never been able to use it for anything. Hmm. And uh, I had a friend of mine who plays trombone came over, and I mean, he could play Mozart on it. On it. <laughs> <laughs> wanted them to, but I just had him do lots of you know brr, 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 kind of things, mm, mm, and mm. pitched it down a little bit and put some reverb on it, and you have this. I mean, it literally sounds like you know a woolly mammoth charging at you. I couldn't, I couldn't get over how great it ended up sounding. Now, for the Udam tribe, I'm assuming this is another bad tribe, you used brushes, bones, antlers, clay pots, wooden artifacts, and male vocals. Again, so why did you use these particular elements, and what were you trying to describe with this tribe, which I, I presume is one of the bad tribes? Exactly. They're very bad. <laughs> I guess um, I guess using bones would imply that's what you're going to become, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Like grind your bones to dust. Mm. They were um now all all of this, especially the Udam, was also heavily influenced by the visuals of the game. Um the Udam are big chunky kind of gorilla looking guys and they've got all these bones hanging everywhere and and antlers sticking out and big furs and lots of like wooden plates and it's all the the character design for this game was just phenomenal and i remember seeing the first couple of just renders of 
the Udam. And I thought, I, I want it, it would be so cool if the music could sound like, you know, that guy was standing in my studio, mm. uh, not killing me. And, <laughs> and I had some microphones and I was playing these, these different sort of things. And, you know, I did the fence uh, with, with Tomb Raider and I've done a couple of other non-musical things, playing my desk or using a phone book for something. But I love the idea of really just trying... What, what could I get that was completely natural? And for the Udam, there is no no real instrument, I mean, other than my voice, but, I mean, that's just a, a vocal. So all the sounds you hear are coming from this big table that I had made with all this stuff sitting on it. Clay pots and lots of big pieces of wood, little pieces of rock, bamboo, uh, two different bushes that uh, you hear lots of, like, kind of... <laughs> kind of ah. crunching stuff in the background for the udam those are the bushes and um uh, uh big pieces of wood like firewood that would get rubbed ah. against the against the box which actually ends up sounding like bass notes essentially mm. mm -hmm. uh I, I was surprised how much kind of musical performance came out of the udam especially uh you get the really embarrassing like my kids hang out here a lot because I work from home. I'm just in a building behind the house, but they'd be you know, one of them would be sitting here, and I'm recording all these plants and everything. She's going, "That sounds good, Daddy." I'm like, "Oh, thanks." <laughs> and at the end, I always do the last bit, like the the vocal and a couple of the other kind of bass sort of sounds. And I just flat out had to tell her each time, just you know, head upstairs to the to the bed. You know, we have a guest bedroom upstairs. Just go up there, give me like five minutes. I'm going to do the vocal, and she goes, "Okay," because I'm literally just sitting there going, "Oh,", oh, 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 oh. It, I feel so stupid. The literal caveman you know, grunts and and stuff like that, but. I just transposed it down, you know, like maybe a major second or a minor third and put a little bit of distortion on it. And all of a sudden it sounds like this, this giant caveman guy is coming to basically bash your skull in. So you know, it's, it's all about con convenience really. And what, how much stuff I can play because we didn't want to, you know, we didn't need lots of musicians. We needed it to be super primitive and, uh, you know, sloppy and, and messy. And that, that, that's, that's, easy for a drummer to be sloppy. <laughs>
So am I correct is that in the fact that you really performed just about all the music yourself with the exception of some of the other the brass players and singers that you brought in for certain tracks, but it's, it sounds like most of it was done yourself. Right, Maluka sang on the Izula tracks, and and Alan played the uh, the horn, the which is let's get it straight. It's a ram, a literal ram's horn. Uh, he played for the for the Wenja, mostly for the the hunts, and then everything else was me. It was all live. Wow, incredible. Now, we were mentioning briefly about the use of languages in this game. The, the level of immersion in this game is so astonishing, not just in terms of the graphic graphics or, or the music, as you describe, but I understand that they even came up with a proto-Indo-European language with linguists, the, their own defined syntax and structure. They actually created these languages, three different dialects for the tribes. I'm wondering, for a fictional action game, why is this level of immersion on every level so important? It's kind of like what we were talking about in the beginning. If if a game works, you actually don't realize how much is going on behind the scenes, how much has been, how much time and love <laughs> and research has been put into it. Where if a game doesn't work, you know, you don't even maybe realize why it doesn't work it's just like yeah i mean it was okay i didn't really get that excited about it it's it's all of those un unrecognized things that i think really put a good game over the top and the immersion level is it's right there number one i in in for me if if you've got these different languages and you know it's like the klingon language for star trek people <laughs> learned it and they can speak it and they're like conjugating their own verbs <laughs> klingon and everything that's the kind of thing that um these game companies they they're all basically big nerds and and i mean <laughs> that in the best way possible because i'm one too and they want to make a game they're like yeah we could research we could do we could do our own you know prototype language we could do three of them you know <laughs> one for each tribe and i mean i went up and saw the sound guys before i got started and they had they had ha uh, had folks from different universities coming in showing them like how to make arrows and how they would take these pieces of what kind of rock was it it's like a really shiny not like quartz but um, like obsidian or, or something where like a flint kind of thing, but like glass, but it wasn't glass. It was rock and they hack away it until you get an arrow. And it was this really clinky high sort of glass metallic sound. And I used some of those ideas in the score. It's just every aspect of it. Just like if you're working on an animated movie, if, if the sound for the animated movie doesn't match up with everyone's imagination when they're watching it because it all needs to be done from scratch, then the the picture isn't complete. You end up losing the the viewers. They're not immersed in the in the movie. And now we're talking about an interactive animated movie where you can walk anywhere and knock all the plants over and hit a you know hit hit your club against the side of the building and you've got to have the right lighting and it's got to sound the right way and it just all, it's like a snowball. And when it works, then it really, really is the, the best. It's like the whole being greater than the sum of its parts. You really become part of that world. And it becomes such a visceral, emotional experience when it's done just right, doesn't it? Yeah, you're, you're engaged, you know, you, you lose yourself. That's why I love watching films so much. I love the storytelling and, you know, how the, the director has his vision of whatever world the movie is taking place in. You, you kind of soak it all in and you get a, a different perspective. Now, unlike film scoring, which you have done a lot of as well, film and TV, but video game music has to react to the gamer's actions and decisions, and you can't predict them beyond certain parameters. But, you know, as opposed to being a simply linear experience with a beginning, middle, and end for film or TV. You know, in one of your inter interviews, you described a really interesting four-layer process for structuring scores for video game scenes that can take into account any action that the player does. Could you describe how that works? <laughs> Well, within the context of Far Cry, 
the the game's really split in half in terms of the music. There was a there was a linear story that was scored pretty specifically. So if you end up uh, walking over to where you're going to be assigned a mammoth hunt sort of expedition, I had all the movies ahead of time that take place and all the gameplay and specific pieces were written to go with that specific action in the game. So just to help folks who have never played games before, I guess what I should clarify, video games in a sense are nonlinear, but there's also what we call these cutscenes. They're like mini movies at certain points. So within between the cutscenes, you'll have a range of actions that you can do. But then if you succeed at the end, then you're rewarded with another mini movie which progresses the story along. That finishes, then you see another sequence where you can do whatever you want. And then again, if you succeed, the next mini movie, so on and so forth. And that's how the story, so to speak, progresses. Is that an accurate depiction? Yeah, I think that's a good a good general idea. And yeah. if the composer does his job right, this started with Dead Space 3, I believe. There are so many ways you can get in and out of all these little quick time events. Sometimes they can only be the little mini movies. They could be like a second or two seconds long or 20 or 30 seconds long. And the music needs to be seamless. So the point is you've got specific actions, specific things that happen in the game, and I'm writing specific music for them. The other half of the game is the open world exploration. And with the first half, it's very linear. The player kind of has to go down this path. The second half, the open world, well... It's the opposite. It's completely open-ended. So how do we get music that's going to underscore what the player's doing when we don't know what the player is going to be doing? <laughs> and that's why the tribe's music was so important for each tribe to have a different sound. So instead of scoring the player's actions or the player's decisions, we scored the player's location. Ah, if cool. they're in Udam territory, we've got the Udam music and then whatever's happening around them, they're, they're sneaking or they're fighting or they're running or they're dying. That's all based in the Udam Sonic world. And same thing for Isla or if you're in your own territory or maybe hunting some of these. They have these epic hunts with these big animals that you can track down. So that's the, that's the, the basic version. Of course, that ends up being you know, an Excel sheet of five or six pages and, and hours and hours of music. And I don't know how those guys end up putting it all into the game and, and having it work, but they do, and they do an amazing job. Incredible. Now, I understand that you studied film and TV scoring at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles. Yep. I'm wondering, what made you decide to move back to Raleigh, North Carolina, instead of staying in L.A., where there's so much film and TV work? And, and ironically, I was working a lot. I, I started working a couple of months into my school just because a previous student had called and needed an assistant. So I found myself assisting, basically writing music for him and then writing music on my own as well and not even really going to class. <laughs> um, I felt kind of bad because it's an expensive program. Yeah. I, I remember I called my folks and my dad was like, why are you in LA? Well, I want to do film and, and TV music. Okay, so are you going to finish your TV show today or are you going to miss your deadline and go to class and listen to someone talk about writing for TV? I'm like, okay, yeah, so I'll go to, I'll finish my TV show and <laughs> Um, maybe I'll actually graduate, but <laughs> I had the benefit of kind of being fast tracked in a way. And I was just, I was working really, really hard. I have no problem with that. That's what I do now. But musically speaking, I was at the bottom of the totem pole. So it was a lot of copy this, copy that. Um, and lots of, lots of work for People who arguing against each other for the same thing. Lots of, like, I did a Honda commercial, I think, for seven weeks. And it was, um, oh, geez, I mean, like 50 or 60 different versions of this Honda commercial oh that goodness. was Ugh. 30 seconds long. Ugh. And and there was no rhyme or reason to it. It wasn't like we were getting close on version 20, you know, sometimes then <laughs> they go back to version 10 and well, maybe that's good. And let's try this. And the thing that they liked before now they don't like anymore. And just a lot of, hmm. it was, it was creatively very frustrating. And I decided that I would rather either write music on my own 
and, and get another job doing something or write music for independent films, which is actually kind of an up and coming scene in North Carolina in the mid nineties. Mm-hmm. They had a TV studios here and some films being shot. So, um, I left and came back home and started doing that. And video games pretty much ended up being what the exact thing, the exact thing that I didn't know I wanted. It was, they're exactly what I wanted back then when I was in LA. I just didn't know it at the time. Mm. And it probably wasn't as mature an industry as it, as it is now. Oh, I mean, it, definitely, definitely yeah, not. And I, I had the benefit of coming up through the ranks in games and doing lots of, lots and lots and lots and lots of little titles before something like Dead Space or Tomb Raider, where there's kind of an established voice and and I'm allowed to be creative and allowed to experiment in things. <laughs> Now, video games are a $101 billion industry worldwide. It's huge. I'm wondering, in in today's climate, now, of course, the competition is a lot bigger, the industry is a lot bigger. What advice do you have for composers or musicians looking to get involved or break into the video game industry? The biggest trick doing music, especially music for games, that's probably one of the hardest things to do in the kind of game creator space because every other job has multiple people doing it. I mean, yeah, the creative director doesn't have assistant creative director, but the creative director was some other position in the previous game at that company. Mm. The composer is just like the composer, especially if they're uh, freelance, if they're hired outside. If you're the second choice for composer, well, congratulations, you still didn't get the job. So it's kind of like all or nothing. It's almost like saying, I want to be a movie star when I get out of school, or I want to be an Olympic athlete when when I get out of school. It's a very, very, very specific, super long range goal. Mm. That being said, um, I think my advice would be to uh, widen your perspective a lot because there's a lot of things that you can learn not writing music for games that will actually make you a better composer of music for games. Now, this is, of course, all from my experience. Like we said, voiceovers and recording commercials and bands and stuff like that. So everything that you can learn, I don't care if you're an assistant working for free at a recording studio, getting coffee uh, while they're recording vocals and talking about compression and and ascend to the reverb and you're slepping mic stands and you're learning how to wrap a cable. I can't believe how many people come into the studio and they want to hang out and I'm wrapping some cables and they have no clue how to even do it properly. <laughs> well, I didn't either until I actually was in a studio and someone smacked my hands and said, what are you doing? <laughs> I, I was wrapping it like I did in Boy Scouts. With the rope, which is, that You're not supposed to do that. But experience, experience, experience. Get as much experience as you can. I mean, working at a radio station, working at a recording studio, uh, uh, helping a composer, uh, getting coffee for uh, someone in town that also does music stuff. I mean, anything that mm. even touches the industry is a chance to learn. And while you're doing that, you're also writing music because if you want to write music, you're going to have to write a lot of music. Um, you can't just, you know, turn it, turn it on when, when you need to. And it should be, I think almost impossible for you to not write music because even if no one's asking you for anything, you've got all these ideas and you've got a computer and you just got some new cool software or this magazine just came out that talked about all this new free software and you want to download that and try it. It's important to, to feed that, that urge and, and use it to learn more stuff and finish the music that you start. Even if you get real depressed, just like I do. And I think everybody else does after a day or two on the same thing, ah, this sounded so great before, but now I don't know. Well, I have no choice. I have to send it off, even if I'm not thrilled with it. And if you're doing it for yourself, it's real easy to just kind of put it in the desk drawer and, and ignore it. But I think it's important to finish things so that you have a sense of closure and then you can move on to something else. Mm, thank you. That is such powerful, powerfully helpful advice. Now, if you don't mind, I'm going to break the fourth wall a little bit. <laughs> this interview that we're having right now came as a result of your publicity agent contacting me. Now, with you've got so many incredible credits scoring for not only video games, most of them, many of them, A-list top performing games. You've also scored for TV and for films. You've got a big name out there, Jason. What 
I, I, I'm wondering <laughs> what benefits do you find from hiring a publicity firm? Hmm. That's that's a really that's a really great question. Um, I, I guess for for me, I don't feel like. I mean, I, I feel like the same guy I was 15 or 20 years ago. And having Greg Greg O'Connor Reed as a publicist, he helps kind of legitimize what I'm doing and gives me real world perspective on it. So that that means a lot, kind of internally and and personally, but. I remember when I was doing my audio company, I was taking some uh, kind of advertising-esque sort of uh, audio books and things like that. And the thing that always stuck with me is um, you have to make sure that your um, your external image kind of equals your internal reality, meaning, you know, basically you can – be doing all this great stuff internally, but externally, if no one knows about it, it it it's pretty much means nothing. I mean, w- word of mouth, uh, name recognition, anything that you can do to get your face and name in front of folks is is pretty much priceless. Mm. I, mean, I wouldn't say there's no such thing as bad publicity because I think you could get bad publicity, but I I my end goal when I hired Greg at first. Um, Little small jobs before Dead Space, but when Dead Space came out, before it came out, I spoke with him, and he was really excited about the game. And I was kind of like, "Eh, I mean, it's it's pretty, you know, it's pretty horrible to listen to. I don't really think anyone's gonna think anything about it." And he was, I mean, he's like, "Oh my gosh, this is so great! I can't wait. We should do a campaign for it." And and I pretty much put him on retainer then, and he's been working for me ever since then. So even when I don't have a specific game, you know, today we're talking about Far Cry mostly, but sometimes, you know, I don't have a game that comes out every month. So sometimes it's just um, general general things with magazines or radio interviews, especially kind of compilation things where there'll mm-hmm. be a couple of composers in Post Magazine they are talking about music for games. Being in on all that stuff, it's just you can't put a price on that. Having name recognition where if someone mentions my name or mentions a game that I've worked on and they can see my face in their head or think about, oh, wait, didn't he do Tomb Raider as well? That kind of thing, that's the invaluable, like intangible thing that you want people to have so that you're – you're, you're recognized professionally and they can think about you. That's the best way to have a job when someone contacts you because they've heard of something else you've done or someone recommended something else that you've done that they recognized. The cold call for work is always the hardest. You know, yeah. you want it to be the opposite, if at all possible. Mm. It really speaks to the necessity of keeping that image, that brand alive. It's not just simply, okay, we're going to run an ad and that's it. But it's, it's really, as you just mentioned, staying top of mind through as many different points in the media as possible. And I have to say, it's it's an absolute honor to be part of your your marketing campaign. And I want to thank Greg, <laughs> uh, really thank Greg yeah. for putting me in touch with you and giving me an opportunity to tell your story. It's just, it's just an absolute delight for me. So Well, for me as well. I appreciate it. Well, listen, we want to f- I want to end on a, on a fun note. <laughs> in my deep, deep research, I, under- I found out that you're also – a passionate foodie. Now, what is it about musicians and oh, good yeah. food? <laughs> I, I don't know. It's, um, so you have to tell me, what are your favorite cuisines to cook? And do you have any special recipes that you could share? Um, well, I mean, cooking for me is, is pretty much the exact same thing as composing. Composing and mixing, that's, that's what cooking is. Because you're taking – you know, the, uh, a, a chicken and whatever other ingredients you've got, same ingredients that everybody else has, but you make it your own way, right? You give it your own sort of identity and your chocolate cake is going to be different from other people's chocolate cake because it's a recipe from your grandmother and, and you're from like me, you're from the South. So my chocolate cake is going to be different. Mm-hmm. But, um, what, you know, I, what I actually love to eat talking about Southern food, I, I love, like some of my favorite places in town, there's a Loatian place that's kind of um, like Loatian American in a way. Mm. So a lot of the flavors, this is what I love about cooking. You know, a lot of the flavors are very uh, Loatian or Vietnamese, but the 
some of the ingredients, it's like a piece of, um, you know, broiled fish that's actually a very American kind of thing because it's a southern fish here in the States. I I love stuff like that. There's a Korean place that we really love to go to as well. Um, but there's also this amazing burger place. So I, I think I pretty much love all food. As far as recipes go, you know, I can probably – Find it on Facebook. I discovered. <laughs> well, I what, discovered what are you known for? I mean, if someone comes to your house and says, you have got to taste Jason's fill uh, in the blank. <laughs> well, I, when I was in England for Dead Space in 2009, I discovered banoffee pie. I've never heard of that. What is oh, banoffee pie? Oh, my gosh. It's basically a combination of the two words banana and toffee. Oh, 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 oh you sold me already. Wow. Banoffee. That sounds so, heavenly. I have a banoffee pie recipe that I've basically perfected over the last couple of years. That's a combination of like five other recipes. Oh, oh, oh wait, wait, um, wait, wait, would you send it to me, please? Please. Yeah, yeah. Please. I, I, I literally. <laughs> I, mean, I love it so much that I did a picture by picture recipe on <gasps> Facebook. Oh, okay. Please send me the picture. Send me the recipe. We'll put I them will. in the show notes. <laughs> I'll, send it, I'll send it to you. It's it's literally just like graham cracker crust. Bananas and toffee and, and whipped cream, um, but it's the most decadent, rich, <laughs> fantastic. Oh, it's amazing. See what I mean? Musicians. Yeah. And food. We, we, we're not just passionate. We're good. We, we <laughs> know how to find the good stuff. <laughs> right? <laughs> Absolutely. Jason, thank you so much for this fascinating look into an amazing cutting edge medium for cutting edge music. I mean, you know, people talk about how difficult it is to get contemporary music out there. It's out there in a major way and that I think many musicians and serious musicians and serious music lovers may not realize. It's so, so, so fantastic. Well, thanks for having me. It's always wonderful to have somebody else's perspective. You know, we're just composers sitting in the dark by ourselves all day <laughs> writing music and occasionally getting to go conduct some orchestras so it was wonderful being on the show oh i hope you'll make some banafi pie for me when i come visit you in raleigh <laughs> absolutely you got Woo-hoo! it okay great for links to jason's website as well as his delicious looking banafi pie recipe on facebook visit the show notes at amusicallife.com If you enjoy these stories about making music and the things that move our souls, please support this podcast by telling a friend and posting a short review on iTunes at amusicallife.com forward slash review. Thank you. Until next time, I'm Hugh Sun, and I wish you a musical life.